difference between Android obfuscation and uh, obfuscation you see for x86 code, like for uh, PC malware or PC programs. But in many ways, the obfuscation for Android mirrors the development uh, in an accelerated way of the, uh, the obfuscation for x86. So it's sort of like if you can go back in time 10 years and look at what PC applications and PC malware obfuscations like, that's kind of where Android is right now. But it's growing very quickly. And then after that, I'll go over two of the sort of common deobfuscation strategies, and that is pattern-based, pattern matching. And uh, the, I think there's only one thing that does this right now for Android, which is the virtual execution, which is similar to the um, Unicorn engine, which I think we'll be talking about later today. And that's with small EVM and Simplify. So for the overview of obfuscation types, so the different obfuscation types are identifier remapping. This is a fancy way of saying changing the names of things and remapping them into something else. Uh, normally, it's called remapping because the mapping file is retained so that the original person who obfuscated it can reconstruct the original names if they wanted to. And I think people call it identifier remapping because it sounds cooler than renaming. And then there's literal encryption. So that's strings, numbers, array payloads, et cetera. Any kind of literal could be encrypted. And then white noise. Uh, white noise is just a generic term, uh, meaning like meaningless noise. So like I think of the static from uh, whenever you turn on an old television to a dead channel and it's just black and white fuzz, and that's sort of noise, that's white noise. And I'll show you an example of that later. And then there's Packers. Um, Packers really took off maybe a year or two ago, and uh, there's been some really interesting research on how to do unpacking and how to do packing. And this is probably the most quickly evolving and quickly developing type of ob obfuscation we'll see. This talk doesn't focus on it, but it does give a high level overview of the stuff out there. But if you're interested in Android obfuscation and deobfuscation, it's a really, really hot field right now. There's a lot of cool stuff going on there. And then other, so there's lots of different miscellaneous types of obfuscation um, that, we'll, that we'll sort of go over really quickly. And uh, there might even be more types of obfuscations invented you know, by the end of this talk. It's a very hot field. So the first one I mentioned is identifier remapping. And so identifiers are things like class names, method names, variable names, so like the, the theme here is like the names of everything. And um, if you've done any sort of Android development, um, when Android first came out, uh, there, you had to use ProGuard manually. And ProGuard is an optimizer, and as a side effect of optimization, it can do this identifier remapping, and it can strip debugging info. And the purpose of ProGuard is to make a smaller APK, to make smaller code. But what ends up happening is you strip out some information that's useful to people who are doing reverse engineering, and it becomes much harder to look at the application and understand what's going on. It takes a lot more effort. Um, and now with modern Android development, as of maybe two or three years ago, they added ProGuard in by default. It's very, very easy to enable. So if you're doing any sort of Android reverse engineering, if you reverse more than like zero apps, you will probably see something that's been ProGuarded. There's lots of different configurations for it, though. So sometimes it's not hard. Sometimes it's pretty easy to get around it. It's the most common, but it's also very weak. There's much, much better um, the obfuscator, I mean, obfuscators out there other than ProGuard. One of them is called DexGuard, which is a, like a cousin of ProGuard, which is created specifically for Dex files, which is the Android executable format. And I'll show an example of that later. So this is a, a list of an APK that's been decompiled, and this is a list of the classes. And you can tell these have been ProGuarded because the class names have been renamed in alphabetical order. So normally, if you're a good Java engineer, you would give your classes very useful, very meaningful, very descriptive names. And that same good engineering practice is what makes reverse engineering easier. So if you have well-named classes, if you have well-structured packages, if you have good method names and descriptive variable names, 
then it's a lot easier for a reverse engineer to understand what's going on and to broadly individuate the components of the program and to understand how to get it to do what they want to do, for example. And if you're, if you're a company, you don't want people understanding your intellectual property, for example. And if you're a malware author, you just want to make my life harder. And this is one of the ways of doing it. If you look at any one of these classes, you have no idea what they're doing without looking at the code. And um, that's, if, if, this is the most likely thing that you'll see if you're looking at Android apps is uh, classroom mapping. So here's another example. These are just a, a couple super simple methods. And this shows how ProGuard doesn't always obfuscate everything away. So the first thing is that you see some member variables for the classes. And that's like JPEG encoding quality and snap Briro analytics, analytics. These two method or member names are still there. So it shows that they didn't use aggressive ProGuard settings. They might have used a default setting. I think these sort of details are useful to a reverse engineer because you get some idea of how dedicated they are to obfuscating stuff, but uh, it's not always super important to, to know these intricacies. So the next example there is um, param A, uh, or param, and that shows that the parameters or local variable names have been stripped out, and param A is actually an artifact of the decompiler. So that it's not actually called param A, the decompiler just wanted to give you a useful name. If there were two parameters, they would be called param A and param B. And then the third thing to notice here, actually, I think the first thing you might notice is that this code is illegible. It looks like a, a horrible person wrote it. Um, but the third thing here is that the method names have been stripped out and re replaced with single letter variants. And um, in, in fact, what, what program could do is it can overload method names such that you have every method is called A. Every method that has a different method signature can be called A. So you have A that takes zero parameters, A that takes a string, A that takes two strings, and that can be extremely tedious to reverse engineer. So the second type of obfuscation is literal encryption. And this one, I didn't see for a long time looking at Android applications. There's, there weren't any tools that did it automatically, and the only sort of people who were doing it were making their own, and they're usually not very good. And that's strings, numbers, and array payloads. If you're familiar with Smalley and, and Android reversing, you've seen array payloads before. And the way it works is the original, just think the original string, which might say, hello world, is then encrypted to maybe any type of encryption, some sort of two-way encryption. And then that literal is replaced with a uh, encrypted version, and then a call to a method which will decrypt the encrypted version and return the decrypted version. Yeah. Or it could be replaced with a lookup method. So maybe uh, all of the strings are collected, encrypted, and put into a, uh, maybe a hash map or some other type of map where an index maps to the uh, decrypted version. And so the, instead of having just a string there, you would have an integer and then a method to look up the string. And then you have white noise. And uh, white noise is probably the silliest. It's, it usually involves adding many useless operations or method, method calls. And the way you would define useless um, maybe a little bit more formally, is that there's no direct or indirect side effects outside the method. And a side effect would be something like um, it doesn't modify class state. So it doesn't, if you have a method where inside that method it's calling some other method or it's doing something, if it's not modifying member variables in that class or in other classes and all of the changes are local to the method, then it possibly uses code. Um, that there's no network or file input output, so it's not writing anything to the network, it's not writing anything to the file system, those are definite side effects. If, a, if code is doing that, then it's impossible really to tell if uh, it's useless or not. And it doesn't affect the return value. So if it's not modifying the class state, or if it's not modifying the machine state outside of the method, so if it has zero uh, non-local changes, and it doesn't affect the return value, then it can be considered useless. Um, I'll show some examples, some really clear-cut examples of that here in a minute. 
But for a simple example, take this bit of uh, math here. You have x equals 5, and then a bunch of simple math, and then return x. And this, uh, this can trip you up doing reverse engineering. It's, uh, it's very simple to see, it's very obvious, but they could put up, like, when I say they, malicious malware authors can add a lot of this to their code, and it makes reading it very tedious. And you see, like, it's obvious how it could be removed, but you need to develop a tool to do that, which we'll show in a minute. Um, so you can see that the 1 plus 2 plus 3 times 4 divided by 5 modulus 8 doesn't affect the return value, doesn't do any network I.O., so that grayed out bit can be removed without altering the semantics or altering the behavior of that uh, small program. Here's an actual example from some malware that uh, I just pulled out. Um, there's, a, there's a lot going on here. There's, um, there's a little bit of string encryption, you can see with the those weird empty strings, um, but the thing I wanted to point out here is these. So there's a lot of lines that say new integer 8 dot in value. So all that's doing is saying 8. And those values are never used. They never modify state outside of the method. They don't do anything. They don't alter the return value. You could take every single one of those lines out of the program, and you wouldn't alter behavior at all. And the way this looks when you're looking at Java, when you have a lot of this, it can be very tedious, it can be very annoying, especially when you're looking at a disassembly of an Android application rather than a decompilation like this is, then it's even more verbose. All right, Packers. Now, I, I could talk, if any of you wants to talk later, I could just really nerd out and talk about Packers all day. Uh, I think they're super cool, they're really interesting, uh, they're a great way to really hide what you're doing, and there's all sorts of insane stuff you could do here. I could do a whole talk just on this. But the high level basics of what a packer does is the original dex file, or the original binary, Dalvik executable, is replaced with sort of a stub dex file that knows how to unpack it. It's the unpacked dex. So you go from having one dex, with, which has all of your application code, to having two dex files. One of them has all your application code, and one of them can uh, unpack, or one of them can load up the first text file. The original is usually encrypted and hidden somewhere inside the APK. So maybe they take, normally it's all classes.dex. They would take it encrypted with AES or something, and then call it uh, my, my logo.png, and then hide it somewhere in the APK. And then whenever you load the application, it, it replaces the original dex with an unpacker dex. And the unpacker dex is the same for every application. And it just knows to look at mylogo.png, decrypt it with some key, and then use dex class loader to load it dynamically and make it available on the class path so everything else works. And as a reverse engineer, you look at the application, and you, you if you reverse engineer it and disassemble the APK or the Android app, you only end up at it. Um, it, it decrypts and loads the dex at one time. So, like I said, the really interesting stuff that's going on with Packers is how they dynamically load and sort of reconstruct the DEX file. Sometimes it's not just encrypted, it's actually pretty easy to do. You would have a broken DEX file that doesn't disassemble properly because things have to happen at runtime, which are very hard to reproduce during the static analysis. And some examples of these Packers are Benkel, which is also called Secneo, APK Protect, Chihu, or Kihu, and there are, there are more all the time popping up. And they can be very expensive, so you might be able to make a lot of money if you uh, make a really good packer. And some others that are, that are also really interesting, but they, they could take up a lot of time talking about are uh, anti-disassembly. And this type of obfuscation doesn't really alter the code in a way that makes it difficult to understand. It will target specific decompilers, such as uh, JD GUI, Lyuten, uh, Brightcore, uh, Box Smalley, all of these disassemblers and decompilers, and it will break them. It will exploit bugs in the software. If, any, if anyone's used IDA, they've probably seen IDA crash, and there are ways of crashing IDA, and that's um, an obfuscation technique. The other type, which is not very common for Android for now, but is much more common for x86, is using a virtual machine. So if you look at the application, it has this big, complicated uh, virtual machine that's capable of executing its own sort of programming language. And it's very hard to tell what it does because if you just have this generic VM 
that could really do anything. And you have to understand the script that it loads or whatever it downloads, whatever sort of special code that it runs. And you have to run it through the virtual machine and understand that. It takes much longer. And then you have um, reflection. So if anyone's used Java, you've probably seen Java reflection before. This adds another layer of redirection that can make things more difficult. Not only that, but method names and class names can be represented as strings, which you can then combine with um, literal encryption. So you end up having many, many layers of uh, obfuscation. This is what Dexcar does, and I'll be showing something like this in um, the later slide. And then there's native code. So Android allows you to do things like uh, compile C and C++, C and C++ modules, and that makes it a lot harder because it's a whole different language you have to learn how to analyze. It requires different disassembly tools and uh, an entire tool chain. So it more than doubles the difficulty if you can put essential code inside of native code. And then there's control flow obfuscation. And uh, this is, you can think of adding a bunch of go-tos just to jump around the code. And what that will end up doing is it'll end up confusing a lot of analysis tools and it will make uh, reverse engineer's life very tedious. So this, is a, this has been a high level overview of the different types of obfuscation. And now I wanted to get into the different strategies for deobfuscation, what they look like, and the tools that will help you do this. So the first type of deobfuscation is pattern matching. Uh, this is the steps for building a pattern matching based deobfuscator. Are first, you look at the code, you try to understand the obfuscation, and you identify patterns in the code. Uh, for example, when I showed you the uh, the arithmetic white noise, the new integer bit, you could see in the code, okay, this looks like new integer int value, and it doesn't assign it to a variable, it doesn't return anything, and you can then describe that code with a regular expression. So like, for every time you see this exact pattern, I want you to maybe, uh, yes. So you would look for regular expressions, and you'd also figure out what you would need to change to deobfuscate it. And in this case, or in the case of uh, int value with the integer, um, new integer white noise, it would just be remove it. And so that would be the transformation. Uh, so yeah, we're going to be talking about regex here in a minute. I hope no one's eyes bleed. So <laughs> you search for the pattern and apply these transformations. And you do this over and over again until there are no um, changes made. So there's some good and some bad with pattern matching. Uh, the good stuff is, it's simple. Uh, you just have to be okay writing really long regular expressions. And you don't have to make anything complicated. You don't have to do any sort of formal program analysis. You don't have to do interprocedural data flow analysis. You can just make a pattern and change it in some way. So there's usually less code in these types of deobfuscators, so there's less that can go wrong. Usually the less code you write, the better. And they're um, usually easy to extend. Uh, I'm saying this partially because I would like you guys to check out uh, my, my tool and extend it, uh, because it is pretty easy. You, whenever you see a new type of obfuscation, you can usually pretty easily, pretty quickly identify a pattern and then describe it using a regex and then figure out a way to transform it to deobfuscate it. It works really well for certain obfuscation types, uh, but not for all obfuscation types. The bad, of course, is that you're dealing with uh, regular expressions, which for mortals can be very tedious uh, to write. So you just write it once and hope it's right. And the analysis is also very surface level. If you're thinking about how this thing works, it's just looking at, at a pattern in code and then transforming that code in some way. So you're not really getting a deep, penetrating analysis. It's also very brittle. If someone, if you have a very popular application tool that uses pattern matching, and you get targeted by a malware analyst, or not a malware analyst, but a malware author, then they can make one tiny little change in their obfuscation pattern and it would break your pattern. You'd have to change it. And so the tool that I made for dealing with pattern matching the obfuscation is called Dex Oracle. I originally created this uh, to target android.opad, which is a malware family. People were, it's obfuscated with Dexcard. And when people first saw it, they flipped their lids. They thought it was the most 
sophisticated malware ever. They thought it was Stuxnet. I mean, people, I mean, being in the industry at the time, everyone was super uh, alarmist about it. They, they thought it was the end of the world. But really, it was a fairly simple malware that was using a, a commercial office here. So there wasn't a lot going on except for commercial obfuscation. They just searches for regex pattern in the Swali, which is the um, intermediate representation of the intermediate language of uh, a disassembled DEX file. But one of the cool things that DEX Oracle does, in addition to looking for patterns, is it will execute some of the methods on a device or on an emulator. So it, it can do that. By doing that, it improves the depth of analysis. And you can actually get some, uh, get some information that's not local to just the code. And then it replaces those obfuscated method calls or that obfuscated code with uh, the return value of whatever it executed. And this is the uh, URL to it. I'll have these slides available later, and uh, you can check this out. This is actually published right now if you have Wi-Fi. So here's an example. Uh, this language here is called Smalley. If you've ever done any Android reversing, you've probably seen it before. It's, um, it's similar to Java. It's similar to actually called Jasmine. Um, but you can see that there it's creating a constant and storing it in V2, uh, and the constant value is OX60, it's just a number. It's storing three integers, and then it's calling a static method with a very long and confusing name, and this is a uh, string lookup. So it's taking a method with three integers, calling it, and then getting a string back. And that string is the decrypted version of the string. And it's storing that into V2. If you look at this, you're trying to figure out a regular expression that can find this pattern and just this pattern, and you end up getting something like this. Right, so this is one of the negatives of pattern matching, is you end up having, this is a simple one, this is just the one I could fill on the slides. So there's much meaner ones out there. But if you, if, if you look at this carefully, it's actually not that complicated. There's a lot of repetition in here, um, but you know, it can make you sad uh, to, to see this much. But you can see the, the letters in red are the matching groups. So it's pulling out the specific information that it wants. You can see the first one is, or the first three are pull out the numbers, the fourth and fifth are pull out the class and the method name, and then the last one is what variable is the result going into. And you take all of those things, you execute, you can see it's a static method. It takes, uh, Oracle will take all of those integers and build up an actual method call and execute this DEX file, it will execute this method on a device and get the actual return value back. And when you do this, this is the actual method that it's executing. And this is the return value. Wow. So it, it turns, yes, it turns those, uh, uh, those three integers, the method call, and the, the move result into just a, a string literal. And this makes reading and understanding the code not easier, but possible, which is like a stronger way of saying easier. <laughs> and then you have, um, so just a high level overview of the different components. So Dex Oracle is broken up into plugins. And right now there's three plugins that handle generic string encryption. They have a, in each plugin gets the smally files and it searches for patterns and makes changes. And it executes these plugins repeatedly until there are no more changes. And the second part is the driver. And the driver is merged with whatever input smally or input dex file or input APK you have. And uh, there's actually a tool in the Android X SDK called dex merge, which you can use to combine dex files very easily. And uh, if, you, if you use DexMerge, there's probably only about 10 people in the world that have ever used it, even though it's part of the SDK. Uh, so you know, there you go, now you guys know it. Uh, and it's moved over to a device or emulator. So whenever you use Oracle, you have to have an emulator running, or you have to have a device that you don't mind running potentially malicious code in. And the, dr dr the driver uses reflection to invoke whatever methods you give it, and you, it just takes it as command line arguments. So here's a pretty graph just to, to help the idea sink in a little bit better. Is you have the input small driver, the combined with dex merge, that creates a bound driver. This is sort of like uh, binding exe files, 
So in like uh, the x86 malware scene, you can take a, a benign application and then bind a malicious application to it so that whenever you run the benign application, it will execute the malicious application too. This is a similar concept where you have a bound um, dex file. And then the input smally goes through each of the plugins and there's a loop there where it will search for patterns. It will determine any modification that needs to be done. It will do that by executing the bound driver uh, as many times as it needs. And then it changes the, the smally code in memory. And when there are no more changes left, it is finished and it will save everything to the file system. So that was pattern matching. The other type of deobfuscation strategy is virtual execution. And this, this type I've spent the past two, two or three years um, working a lot on. You can ask my wife. I pretty much have been wasting all of my weekends uh, working on this. So very excited to talk about it with someone. And I'm also very excited that we'll be talking about the, uh, the Unicorn engine later, which is sort of like this, but for x86. And the way virtual execution deobfuscation works is it executes the entire method to determine behavior. So it's as similar to intra-procedural data flow analysis. And I, I try not to have a bunch of um, formal jargon on my slides, but uh, for anyone out there who knows this stuff, then yeah, it's kind of like this, but different. And one of the good things about uh, dealing with Smalley, which is uh, the in intermediate language for uh, Android application disassembly, is that it's very regular, it's very well formed. If you're trying to parse Java source code, uh, it can, it's, okay. it's the only thing harder than parsing Java source code correctly is parsing HTML, which is very difficult. Uh, you just don't want to do it if you don't have to. But Smalley is a super verbose, super regular language, and we get almost everything um, just by looking at it. And this sort of virtual execution that you do, it should have identical behavior or identical semantics to the actual execution, which is uh, tricky. And the way deobfuscation works is uh, with virtual execution is that uh, it understands what the program does, and then it replaces the complex or obfuscated instructions with a set of simpler instructions. I'll show you an example of that coming up here in a minute. So again, the pros and cons of virtual execution is that uh, it's much more flexible. Um, it's generalized, it's not specific, it's uh, less brittle than, um, than pattern matching. And also there's no regular expressions, or there's far fewer regular expressions, you just need a little bit uh, for parsing smalling. Uh, but instead of writing just pages and pages of regex here, you're writing a, um, a generalized virtual machine. You get much deeper analysis, you basically get uh, total analysis. You, you determine semantics of the application. Uh, so you could theoretically do much more than what I'm doing with it right now uh, because the analysis is very penetrating. Like I said, it's less brittle, it's generalized. You can take obfuscated applications and you've never seen the obfuscation type before. It can be some homemade, homespun, uh, one-off, never been done before type of obfuscation throw it through this tool and you will have something that uh, is deobfuscated as a result. There's, uh, there's no need to custom implement the obfuscator every time you see a new one. And there's also some things that haven't been done yet but should be interesting. The, the idea is extensible to more than just the obfuscation. I'll talk about that in just a moment. The bad is that it's much harder to implement. There's a lot more code. There's 100,000 lines of code in this, and the more code means more bugs, and it also means it's more difficult. Correctness is a correctness is a constant struggle. Uh, so you're always dealing with, you know, am I executing this code the same way a downloaded virtual machine would execute it? And there's a bit of a need to study uh, program analysis and to pick up on lots of jargon because some of the ideas aren't intuitive, and it really helps to understand program analysis. So the first part of the tool is called Smalley VM. So Smalley is the disassembly language for Android and VM is a virtual machine. It acts like a sandboxed Dalvik virtual machine, which is the VM that Android uses. It takes Smalley or text files or APK as input. It handles unknown values, so if it, if it doesn't know the argument to a method, it can still uh, proceed. It, can, it will just take every execution path. Um, and 
and API methods such as uh, delete everybody's files or file.delete or system dot something are whitelisted. So if it doesn't, if a method isn't whitelisted, it won't call it. And uh, small EVM takes takes an Android application and returns a uh, context sensitive execution graph of uh, each method. Which I'll show you exactly what that means. Here. And but a graph has the virtual machine state for each execution of every individual op. So the graph gets very, very large as uh, the method size grows. But here's an example of a very simple method. You can see that uh, it assigns x to 5. If the parameter you gave it is true, it will return 5 back. Otherwise, it will return 0. And the way this uh, execution graph looks in small EVM, or well, the way this looks in small E first, is that you have a simple method. You have a constant screen of x5. If it equals, if you can see the code. If it equals, it will return to it's simple. And then here is what the execution graph looks like. So even though this is a very tiny, very um, trivial method, the execution graph is getting much larger. You can see that at each address you have at 0, 0.0, the operation is cost um, stored at OX5 and R0. Uh, you can see the value of each register of each parameter at each uh, execution path. Right here you have an unknown value. And that was the value of the parameter. So when it executed the method, it didn't actually know if you gave it a true or a false for the first parameter. So because it's unknown, it will take both execution paths. And the return value for this method is undefined. There's two possible return values. Either it's 5 or it's 0. And in the lingo, in the code, this would say there's no uh, return value consensus. Uh, so you can't say, I always know what this method will return, but in other other examples, you will be able to say that. Some other possible uses of for extending small EVM are I can do data and type flow analysis. If you've ever used suit or any sort of program analysis library, it's an alternative to that. It could, it could potentially do some things better, but suit is very mature, so it would be hard to beat. You can make a reversible debugger. Uh, Firefox has a reversible JavaScript debugger, which I thought was super cool, and you should be able to implement the same thing here. Because you're generating the entire um, uh, context sensitive graph, you should be able to go backwards and forwards and uh, really, really play with the code, uh, which would be interesting. And it would also work for Java if you compile the Java into, uh, or translate the Java into Dapic bytecode using DX, which is very simple to do. None of these things are done yet, but this is sort of like future work that I, I think would be interesting. And then Simplify, which is the second part of the tool. It uses SmallEVM to analyze code and create a graph, and then it applies optimizations to that graph. And it, the sort of optimizations, just to throw out some lingo, constant propagation, uh, dead or useless code removal, reflection removal, so it can unreflect things. And it also does various people optimizations, and people just means uh, like one-off, hard to categorize type of uh, optimizations. And this is the GitHub link. So a quick example, this is a very simple method. Uh, you have one loop, which prints out the result of simple loop, and you have simple loop, which is assigned to the variable, uh, assigns two to x, and then multiplies two twice, so you get four and then eight, and then it returns eight. And then the, the graph for this looks like this. So we don't have to go through the whole thing here, but the important part is the last value there is eight. So it always returns eight. There's no ambiguity in the uh, execution flow. So what you can do is you can do constant propagation and you can do dead code removal and you end up translating that for literal. So just a, a cool real world, real world example of this. Uh, this is an actual malware code and you can't really tell at all what's going on here. You have uh, byteutils.http1, http2. All of those are encrypted byte arrays and then git byte will actually decrypt them. Um, and this is like really, really hard to manually reverse, but using Simplify on this, you could translate it into something like this. So you go from being able to get no surface level information by looking at it to getting some string literals, and these are actually command and control uh, domains and can start doing a lot of much better analysis very quickly. 
So the question actually is, which one's better? Is pattern matching better, or is which one execution better? And the answer, like most things, is both. So and in some cases, you can start off by throwing Ducks Oracle and doing pattern matching at it on an application. And it's sort of like a first pass of the obfuscation. It will do what it can, but it may be not much. Uh, and then you can throw it at Simplify. And Simplify is uh, it's pretty slow. It has to build up a lot of information. So anything you can do to make its job easier is good. And so by using them together, you can usually get a much uh, better analysis and much deeper insight into the obfuscates and stuff. So later when you check out these slides, you can uh, these are some extending reading links. Uh, these are your past past slides like uh, did a malware analysis uh, presentation at DEF CON and then my friend Tim, he has a lot of presentations on packers. He has one of the, uh, probably one of the best on packers right now for Android, you can check it out. And also, uh, thank you very much for listening and paying attention and being here this early. I, I heard that people get up really early here, so that's great. If this would happen in the States, then half, half of you wouldn't have been here. <laughs> Uh, and these are some good uh, Twitter handles for um, anything on ever reversing or malware or hacking. That's it. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Um, we have two micros to make like off the other side of the room, so you just raise your hand and we will give you a link. Uh, okay, I have uh, one question for you. Um, uh, in the first part of your presentation, you're talking about the uh, application methods, okay? And uh, for example, it identifies remarkably, uh, but uh, I think that's the, the problem com uh, coming from the idea that uh, when you have to translate the AP, uh, it will come to the high level language. But I have a new that uh, now we, now we can adjust directly from the APK to the low level language, for example, ascending. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, so what do you think about this? Uh, in this case, maybe we can re maybe we can uh, uh, remove all the application like this. Yes, it's maybe more, uh, it's, it's maybe less complex line, yeah. Like, Identifier remapping. Oh, no, no. I, 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 yes, uh, my question is asked, uh, yeah. If we can transfer directly from the APK to the low level language, for example, a sample code, uh, maybe we can uh, remove all, all the applications, for example, literal mapping, something like this. So, what do you think about this? Uh, for, for certain things, like uh, when, whenever you do this sort of obfuscation, it's, you lose information, and that information has to be reconstructed some way or intuited some way. And um, even if you have really good uh, decoupling and disassembly tools, you still don't know the original method name class name from answering it correctly. Yes, but because we can remove everything, because with the low level maybe we don't have to do with we have to deal with the method name, something that is maybe less complex. It's maybe more simple. Very very more simple. Simple, uh, yes. Yes, it's probably simpler for um, for program analysis, yes. definitely. Mm -hmm. um, you want to normalize everything as much as possible, which is why uh, small is really good for for as an intermediate representation. But whenever you're doing uh, reverse engineering you want to understand, you want those names there. They can give you, they can give you clues as to the personality of the, the person who's making it. They can give you clues as to uh, how professional they are, how technically competent they are. And losing that information is bad. And uh, am, I, am I answering your question? Like, you, for program analysis, it's good to simplify and just maybe strip it out. Uh, in fact, for doing certain types of analysis, you would, you would strip it out yourself. Um, but when you're trying to reconstruct what the program is doing, and you're doing a manual inspection, a manual analysis, then those names can be very, very helpful. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So one more questions. Uh, when you're talking about a smelly VM, uh, yes, you have to deal with the anomaly. Okay. So how you can generate that? Like for example, we uh, I have seen that you have to choose uh, the two 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 paths. The first path the zero with the whether it's the zero and the second is the zero here, but the the value is five. So I think that's maybe you have to uh, you have some way to do with this. How to generate maybe how to generate all the test case something like this. Okay. How to generate what test case? Test case with no value like this. Uh, yeah, that's that's much more into the program analysis side yeah. of things. And I I appreciate with having no background in program analysis, so it's just a hacker trying to deobfuscate stuff. 
And uh, yeah, I think maybe uh, constraint solving and yes. doing like um, fuzzers, uh, things that can can analyze an application and can come up with test cases to give. So maybe uh, maybe we have to, uh, maybe you can uh, think about some trick to do to cover all the possible paths. Uh, yeah, there, there there might be a better ways of doing it. I stupidly go through and execute each each operation, and whenever I don't know a value for something, like uh, if if equals zero, if, if say if register zero equals zero, well, if I don't know the value, if it's an unknown value in register zero, I'll say take both path, both paths, and I don't. And so IBM doesn't keep track of what the value was in, in that if case, but. Uh, yeah, that, that could be interesting. That, yes. that, could, that could be a good addition. Because maybe uh, some bus, maybe in uh, maybe it's the unreachable. Maybe with the bus function, it's the unsolvable, so it's the unreachable. So maybe you can check the whole bus and to find some way to solve this problem. That's it, I think. Uh, yeah, if it's yes. not durable, yeah, you start with the problem, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? We have. Um, mm -hmm. So we didn't laugh? Yes. Uh, which tool is the best for Android application? Android which tool is the best? Which one's best? Uh, this is a vendor neutral uh, conference, so I don't have any opinion. Uh, actually, the, my, my opinion is they're all pretty bad. Yeah, and some are a lot worse than others. Um, as, as someone who's very technical, well, I put it this way. I think a lot of people who worked in, in engineering realize that having like a really good, well-engineered product doesn't always sell well for some reason. But having a, an inferior product and a great sales team uh, and, and charging a lot of money can be really good. But I think that's where the state of things are right now. Um, Dexstar is pretty good. There's a lot of cool stuff coming out of China for Packers. Um, there's new ones coming.